Okay. Um, let's uh, let's get started. So I hope everyone had a good weekend. I hope everything's going okay so far. The semester now we're sort of stuck in. Things are uh, rolling along here. Um, we posted the solutions to last, you know, the current problem set last week. So I put them up. Um, I hope that wasn't too confusing for anybody. Just to remind you, the idea is we're giving you solutions before the homework is due um, because we think this is going to make it easier for you to have a more successful learning experience. But the way to use them is, ideally, I, the way I would use them is not look at them first. Look at the question first, try and figure it out, have a go at doing it. But then when you get an answer, you can then immediately check it. And then if you didn't get it right, you can immediately go back and figure out what happened. Right? And that seems like the, the best time to get that feedback on what happened rather than you know, a week later or something when you sort of forgotten what you were doing anyway. So that, that's why we're handing them out. And then we're going to be grading the homeworks. We're not going to be grading, unfortunately, we're not going to be grading all the questions. But we're going to be grading random selections of the questions. And what we'll be grading you on is like, you know, how you explain how you got the answer. Right, because we presumably you got you got the right answer, and to, it, I guess if you submit a homework that doesn't get the right answer but has a reasonable amount of you know reasonable approach, that's okay, right? But that's that's what we're grading you on is just seeing that you've got the work right, the approach right. Um, but this is an experiment. Um, we haven't done it. I haven't done it before, so let me know if there are any issues or um, problems with that. Any other questions or anything before we get going? Okay, so last week we were talking about um, processing of signals in the time domain. We introduced this key idea of convolution, and then, at the, and then we went through the whole. We went through the formal definition of linear constant coefficient difference equations, which are the sort of the the, the mathematical generalization of these kinds of discrete time systems. Generalization in the sense that there's no distinction between, there's no sense of it being a particular machine, a particular system with an input and output. It's just a mathematical relation between two sequences. When we have a nice general mathematical formulation like that, there's a nice general mathematical solution. We went through the sort of the traditional pencil and paper solution of finding the, um, the characteristic equation, the, the characteristic polynomial, which gives you the complementary solution in terms of these modes that are uh, a system whose left-hand side, whose output feedback, the feedback part, right, which just involves y. If it has a certain number of delays in it, it means you're going to get a polynomial, a characteristic polynomial of a certain order. So if it has two delays, you're going to get a second order polynomial, a polynomial up to lambda squared. And you get some roots from that. You know, in general, you get as many roots as the order of the polynomial. And each one of those roots, a lambda, lambda i, is a, a mode. Lambda, the y of n equals lambda i to the n is sort of a natural oscillation of the system that you're looking at. And then combinations, linear combinations of those modes can occur without any input, with the input x of n equal to 0. And so you get this natural sort of space of behaviors of the system regardless of what the input is. That gives you the complementary solution, but you don't know the actual magnitudes of those different modes. And you look at the input, you find some portion of the output that's going to be driven by the input. If the input is a sinusoid, the output's going to be a sinusoid at that frequency, but with some different amplitude, which you have to figure out. And then by sort of plugging that all in at the end to actually to solve for the difference equation to match the initial conditions, you can find out the amplitudes of the modes. And so it's, it's, it's sort of fairly kind of uh, fiddly mathematical procedure with a bunch of algebra in it. But the sort of the, the big picture that I want you to get from that, I, you know, that's sort of, it's nice from the, uh, there's always this um, attraction in these kinds of classes towards a nice mathematical procedure because something's very easy to test. Right? And so there is, it's like, oh, this is great. We can set questions on this, and we know what the answers are going to be. 
But that's, I, I kind of try and resist that because it's not, it's not, not a very practical thing, not something we're actually going to use. We're un, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever had to solve a difference equation as part of my research, right? But, but there is, it is worth teaching because the, it's, the, it's the big picture, which is like, okay, we have a structure which is defined by you know, the, the difference equation or whatever, defined by the structure of delays and gains and summation nodes in the system. <coughs> and then as a, the, a property of that structure are these natural modes, these, uh, these solutions to the characteristic polynomial. And that's a very, that's a very intuitive thing. That is, you know, the thing that ma makes the pendulum swing at the speed that the pendulum swings or makes the, the bell ring at the, with the note that the bell rings at. And that, that's how it sort of, that's why there's a nice connection between this mathematical thing where we see these solutions coming out. But, you know, so, so a, great, a great example of a, of a linear system with modes is a stretched string. So if you ever played a guitar or something like that, you know, you can pluck it and you get a particular note, but you can also get these harmonics by damping it in the middle and getting the, the note that's an octave higher. And what that is, well, the, the fundamental and then the octave higher and the, the, the harmonics above that, they're all modes of this string. But then with different initial conditions, that is, you know, with different initial pluck shapes, you can get different amplitudes, they're different modes. So playing the harmonic on a guitar is, the, the system's still basically operating its modes, but you've, you've set the amplitude of the lowest mode to zero, so you just hear the modes above that. And it, or in fact, all the odd-numbered modes, I guess. So that's kind of this nice, that's, that's the intuition I have when I'm thinking about there's this space of natural oscillations, which are all composed of these modes, but they can have different amplitudes. And that's what we see coming out of the constant coefficient difference equation process. So that's a kind of a big concept. It would be a nice place to end the class. But then at the very end, I tried to stuff in the stuff about correlation, because um, there was a question on in the homework, which I wanted you to be able to look at over the weekend. Um, but let's just look at that again now. Um, a little, with a little more breathing room. Any questions about difference equations before I start talking about correlation? Okay. So correlation is like the, the, other, the other sort of time domain operation that I want to be able to talk, that I want to introduce. And to find it here, it's, it's, the, it's a relationship between two sequences. And the way to think about it is it's a way of measuring the similarity between two sequences as a function of their relative uh, alignment. And so here's the definition. It's defined as the, uh, the correlation between sequence X and sequence Y as a function of the lag here, which is a time index, but it's not time N, it's time L. And so it's the sum over all time of X times Y delayed by L samples and then summed up over all time. And so it's just the, you know, we were talking about when we're looking at convolution, we were saying, well, it's the inner product of a couple of sequences. This is just directly the inner product of two sequences over all possible shifts. So we've got an argument here. This is a sequence. It's the correlation between two sequences over all possible relative shifts. Of course, because we're summing over all n, it doesn't really matter where we start. What matters is the relative shift between these two. Um, and then if we define it this way, we can talk about R, Y, X. If we interchange X and Y, we get almost the same expression, except the, the, L, the minus L becomes a plus L. So R, Y, X of L is equal to R, X, Y of minus L. Because, and it, it is my observation that um, there's not a very stable definition of which one is X and which one is Y. Um, in fact, I think in the second edition of Mitra, they had it one way, and in the third edition, they changed it the other way. Uh, so you just, because it's not, because there's this, sometimes when you think you're getting correlation, you're getting the time reverse version of correlation. When I write code, this is maybe revealing more than I should, but when I write MATLAB code and I'm using a correlation, I run it. If it gives me the wrong answers, I try flipping the sign of the correlation index, and sometimes that fixes it. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, it's like that. It's just it's difficult to tie down because there's no, there's no obvious right answer. Um, let me just sh show you something in MATLAB here. So this is, uh, this is this idea that we, what we're trying to do with correlation is find, is, is find 
the similarity between two signals. And a very common case for trying to find similarity is kind of like this classical radar case where you send out a pulse, it gets reflected back, but very, very low amplitude. And you're trying to, but you want to know how, what the delay was before it reflected back, because that's the range of the thing that you're trying to detect with the emitted radio pulse. And so you want to find this pulse, but be able to, but you're going to have to do it against a background of noise. So um, here, it, there's a little bit of uh, stuff in the, um, in the diary here. Let me just copy this, and I'll tell you what's going on. Um, OK. So we can, um, we can define a basic, a short sequence, which is going to be our pulse, P. And it's just got some, some arbitrary shape. And then we're going to have a noise sequence here. I'm using the, the MATLAB Gaussian. Is it Gaussian? Yeah, normal noise um, variable. I'm just making a sequence of 20 independent IID values, Y noise values. And so then I make x be the noise plus the signal. So points 1 to 4 of x, I just add the pulse in. So if we look at those now, just going to plot them out in different um, things here. So here's the pulse at some point here. Um, and it's like, it's whatever it was. My, minus 1, 3, 2, 1, right? Minus 1, 3, 2, 1. Here's the noise sequence, which is just a bunch of random independently distributed values. And then here's the noise with the pulse added. And it's, it's added in here, right? This is actually a li lined up. So you can sort of see that compared to this sequence, this one has a little bit of pulse in there. But it's it's not, if you just looked at this, you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, well, there's obviously a pulse here been added. It looks kind of, it's, the variance of the noise stays about the same. So the trick is, like, if we just get this, but we believe it's composed of some noise with a pulse added at some time, can we figure out where it was that it was added? And that's what we would use correlation for. We would basically take this pulse sequence and then calculate the inner product of it against each possible offset within the noisy signal and look for a maxima there. So I have this little animation here which just calculates that um, step by step and plots the results. If I was in the right directory. Okay. So this is um, now the same thing. This is the pulse, but I'm not stemming it. I'm just joining up the points. But it's minus 1, 3, 2, 1. Right. And this is the noise sequence along here. And this is, this is um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sequence and delay it. So it's actually x of n minus l. I, I, on the slide, it was y of n minus l. So maybe, it should, maybe this should be x of n, this should be y of n if we're calculating r, x, y. But again, it's just, it's just labeling. But um, what happens is at each point, I have this four-point sequence. I take the inner product, and that gives me a value. So the first value was here, a little bit positive. The second value now, there's only two points of overlap here. It's a little smaller. I can keep going, and I get these different values. There was a, there was a high alignment there. These, of course, the random sequence is different every time I run this, so this may not work. But um, every time we go along, we take a new point-for-point point inner product. We get a new value coming out here. And there you go. <laughs> um, this is, the, this is the correlation. This is the actual point where we added the pulse. So this is meant to be the maximum. Here we see it didn't work that well, actually, because there was, if we, so what we could do is we could set a threshold here, and we could look for wherever the, or we could, we, if we said we think there's a pulse somewhere in this window, we could look for the largest value. And in fact, I think this is the largest value. Or if we didn't know if there was going to be anything there at all, we could set a threshold and say if we, if we don't get anything above that threshold, we don't, we don't see a reflection. Here, I would say that we'd probably end up with several points above the threshold, which wouldn't be so great. But let me just try it again with a new random draw. Um, x equals n, and then x, and then. Oh, there you go. And that one's nice and clear. There you see. 
And this, this sequence, it just for, because of different random numbers, it is kind of nicely lined up here. And here we get this nice cross-correlation with this big, pul this big maximum where the pulse occurred. And that's more like it was meant to behave. Although in that case, it's kind of obvious it's going to work because it's the biggest peak in the signal anyway. But that's, that's the idea of correlation. It's sliding one signal against another, calculating the inner product, and then looking. And when we see a big maximum, it means we have a big positive correlation between the two signals there, which implies that one contains the other. Um, okay. So um, we notice that this looks quite a lot like convolution, except in, this is the convolution equation, right? X of k, convolution of two values is a function of n, two sequences are a function of n is x of k times y of n minus k summed over all k. We define correlation as x of k, x of n times y of n minus l summed over all n. If we just change the names of the variables, we can make it now a function of n instead of l to make it look more like convolution. We can make the summation variable k instead of n, and now it becomes x of k, y of k minus n. And so the only difference here is the the sense of the second sequence, right? One is in, co in convolution, the k's go in opposite directions. Like, you know, we said that one way of thinking about convolution was as the, cor the inner product between a sequence and a time reverse, time shifted sequence. Correlation is the in inner product between a sequence and a time shifted sequence without the time reversal. What that means is we can calculate correlation by time reversing and then just performing convolution. And because convolution is something that systems do, this is an actual very practical way of, of building a correlator, or a, as it's called, a matched filter, where you just have a system whose impulse response is the time reversed version of the, uh, of the, of the pulse you're trying to find, right? Because this is, if, if, we, if we have a system where this is the impulse response, then the output of that system will be this convolution here, which will be the correlation we want to calculate. Um, we can talk about correlating a signal with itself, which is called autocorrelation. So Rxx is just Rxy, but with y equal to x. Um, because of that, because we know that if we interchange these two variables here, we get the time-reversed version of the correlation sequence. So that means that RxL of, Rxx of L must, equal to, must be equal to Rxx of minus L, which is to say Rxx has to be symmetric around zero. The zero point itself is just the sum over all n of x of n times x of n, or the sum over all n of x squared, which is normally something for a real sequence is the energy of the sequence, right? It's just the sort of the sum of the intensity of the signal overall time. We could, yes, we're, we're, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with complex sequences here. Typically, we would actually define this with conjugation, so even if x was, was complex, we'd still get the, mag the energy of the signal. Um, it turns out that the, for an autocorrelation, not only is the value at zero the total energy of the sequence, it's also the largest possible value in that autocorrelation sequence. And you can understand this a bunch of different ways, but basically it's, it's this sort of... Uh, triangle inequality that if you want to get the maximum correlation between two, two high-dimensional vectors and you're constraining the total magnitude of the two vectors, then the best way you can do that is by having them both be the same. The way that makes most sense for me is this uh, thinking about the inner product as the, the geometric inner product, the distance between two, the, as a way of something you can do with two vectors in some high-dimensional space. In that case, the inner product is the, uh, which is just the point-wise multiplication of, the dimension, of their individual dimensions, but it's also equal to the magnitude, the, t the magnitudes 
times the cosine of the angle in between them. So this is obviously maximized if you hold these magnitudes constant. It's maximized when the angle in between them is zero, which means that they're pointing in the same direction, which means that they have the same values in every dimension, or at least they're proportional to each other in every dimension. I, I'm sure you've seen this idea before. Maybe you have your own way of, of understanding it. But this is, so this is the case that um, I guess the, the bottom line here is that if we have an autocorrelation, the zeroth point is always the largest point. At least there are no points larger than the zeroth point. Yeah? What's the application for autocorrelation? So, yeah, what is the application for autocorrelation? So correlation is finding one, one signal as being similar to some part of another signal. Autocorrelation is finding that a particular signal is similar to itself with a particular shift. And in particular, well, there are various ways of understanding that, but one is like, well, if I have a signal, I shift it by a little bit, how, how much does it change? How rapidly does it change? If the correlation drops only slowly, it means a signal is not, doesn't change that rapidly. It's, it's, it's correlated with local versions of itself. And that's a very, that basically means it's sort of moving slowly. Right, so that's kind of interesting. If the correlation drops and then goes up again, it means, okay, well, the signal has some stuff going on, but then it starts to repeat. And that's a signal that's periodic or has some periodicity to it. And so that's, uh, that, those, those are both very important situations. If a signal, one, one thing that you might want to know is like, well, I've got, like, in, in a situation, you know, in this acoustic situation, if I was speaking and then there was a wall behind me, and so my voice was bouncing off the wall, you know, in an extreme case, that would be you'd hear my voice and you'd hear an echo. In a, you know, with smaller delays, you can't hear the echo. But if you measured the signal, you'd be able to see, you know, if, that was, if I, I made a very, very sharp blip, you'd see the signal and you'd see the echo. If you wanted to do that more systematically, you could calculate the autocorrelation of the signal that you hear, and you say, oh, look, every time there's a little feature here, something similar to that occurs a little bit later. The autocorrelation would sort of even out the property. If you did it over a very long amount of signal, it would even out the properties of the source, but you'd see this, this consistent echo coming out. So it's actually quite a useful way for measuring, um, for blind measurement of, of channel characteristics. We'll see some of that later. Um, okay, so this is the point I was making. If, if the signal itself is periodic, so if x, if x of n is equal to x of n plus big N, where n is the period, yeah? Uh, yeah. 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 I, I kind of, I kind of um, fudged on that. Basically, if you, so the argument is, if you have The, 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 ident the fact is that if you have two sequences, two high-dimensional sequences, so let's say I mean, they could be three-dimensional, they could be 100-dimensional, a sequence of some length, right? And you take their inner product, so you do a point-for-point point point multiplication. Let's say you've got one sequence which is predefined, and then you, 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 you can choose another sequence, and you're trying to choose the sequence that will give you the largest inner product, right? So it could be anything. Well, obviously, if you just have a second sequence which is very large, then the inner product is going to, if you scale up the second sequence, it's going to get larger. Okay, so now we're going to say, choose me a second sequence that has some constraint on its size, like maybe I, you know, the sum, the, the total energy is fixed, that now gives me the largest possible inner product. And the solution to that is, okay, you want the second sequence to be proportional to the first sequence. So when the first sequence is large, you want the second sequence to be large on those points in those dimensions. When the first sequence is negative, you want the second sequence to be negative on those dimensions. When the first sequence is close to zero, you want the second sequence to be close to zero. And I kind of, this is my way of thinking about it, that if you think about these point vectors in high dimensional space, then you want them pointing in the same direction in every dimension. But it's, it's sort of, it's, that's not tremendously transparent to me that that's the solution. But it's sort of, another way of thinking about it is, because of the nonlinearity of x squared, if you've got some mass, some large dimension, and you, can you put it on any of these things, 
you want to put your largest part on the thing where it's large in the other dimension because then you get the power of x squared and it gets super large. If you put this large bit on something that's small, you've kind of wasted it. So that's, that's, the, that's what comes out. You could easily, you could prove it with like, you know, uh, just differentiating the, the point piecewise product and you'd get this coming out. But that's the idea that if you have two signals um, and they're both the same magnitude, so now if I'm shifting these signals both next to each other, the total energy stays the same. When are they going to give the, the largest inner products when, they, when they're proportional, which is when they line up? And that's at lag zero. So two signals that they have to be the same signal, at all lags other than zero, they're probably not identical, unless it's periodic. But in general, they won't be identical. But at zero, they will always be identical, so that's going to give you the biggest, biggest pulse. Okay. So here's, here's the situation where it is, there is a second alignment, or in fact, there's infinitely many alignments where they do line up perfectly. Um, actually, a periodic sequence, of course, goes on forever. It doesn't have finite energy, right? If we actually just try and sum up over all n, x twiddle squared is like, well, it keeps going, keeps getting bigger. So we have to kind of uh, modify our definition a little bit here, which is, again, this is not at all rigorous. This is just um, purely... Uh, this is just pragmatic. And here I'm going to define for, a, an, for an infinite length sequence, for a periodic sequence, this is totally a special case. For a periodic sequence, I can redefine my correlation. This would normally be the correlation, just sum of all over all n of x times x twiddle. But now I'm going to take the sum over some finite number of points, say maybe a finite number of periods, and then calculate the per point average here. So this is a, a 2n plus 1 point summation. Just taking the average there. I get a value out. And this value is useful because that is, that is actually proportional to you know, the autocorrelation of some any, any finite length subsequence of this periodic sequence. It's the, you know, this thing converges. As m gets larger, this converges to a stable value. OK, so we, we uh, we have something we can talk about, and it's going to show us where there are, there are similarities in the signal. And um, I guess so this is, we're just defining it here. That this, is, this is going to, for any stretch of M, as we let M get larger, it's going to converge to what, we, what we'd get with the autocorrelation of exactly one cycle of this, because every cycle repeats, so the whole thing just behaves the same. And then when we've done that, the zeroth, you know, zeroth index is now the total energy of one cycle, um, which we can call the power. I mean, this is the, the per sample energy of average energy of, of the periodic sequence. So we, if the time, uh, you know, a, a time normalized energy is power. Um, and then we have this, that if we have the autocorrelation shifted by exactly one period, then you know, because of the periodicity of x, we end up with the same thing. So the autocorrelation of this periodic sequence is itself periodic. What that means is we have the maximum, because for any sequence, the, the zeroth value of the autocorrelation has to be the maximum, has to be the energy, or in this case, the power. And we're going to get that maximum recurring every n samples. It's going to be symmetric, but there's going to be a maximum of zero, maximum of n, maximum of minus n, maximum of 2n, maximum of minus 2n, etc. Um, so that's, you know, something we can look for. And again, if we have a sequence, we're not sure if it's periodic or if it's maybe not exactly periodic but has some restricted range of periodicity, we can look for something that looks like a periodicity or a, a flanking peak in the autocorrelation and it indicates the periodicity. So um, this is just to sort of get you thinking about the intuition of these um, autocorrelations. For any arbitrary signal, the autocorrelation is going to be large and positive in the middle, and it's going to have some shape, some arbitrary shape off here, but it's going to be symmetric around zero, and it's going to have its maximum. Or certainly, there's going to be no point at which it's larger than um, it is at the middle. It can go negative, because you know, a negative correlation is when a signal is approximately pointing the opposite direction in vector space. And if you have something like a sinusoid, you know, if you shift it by half a cycle, then it's kind of negatively correlated with itself. So this thing can go negative, but then the negative excursion can never be larger than this magnitude here. It has to have a maximum magnitude of zero. 
for periodic sequence, we have the same kind of thing of a maximum, but then we have this maximum recurring every, every period in both directions. It's still uh, even. For a cross-correlation between two sequences, none of that holds, right? So the, the value at zero is, has no special properties. It's just because zero is like just some arbitrary uh, point of reference between two sequences. So it, has, it will have some maximum value because every sequence has to have a, a maximum, although it might not be unique. It'll go positive, negative, could be basically anything. Um, so here's some examples of those. So here's a arbitrary little signal, X of N. Here's its autocorrelation. These, these I did in MATLAB, so they're, they're real signals, but they're not. They're, they're finite length sequence signals. Here's the autocorrelation. So here's zero. Here's zero lag. Here's our maximum. And then we see here's the autocorrelation, which goes negative and then wiggles around. Could basically be anything, but it's symmetric around zero. This is a little bit of signal, which is actually one of these speech vowel waveforms, and these are little pitch pulses. So this is, um, well, we don't have time here. We've got it in samples, but it's got a period of about uh, 28 samples or something like that. And then what we see here is that here's this nice maximum in the middle. It's actually got a lot of um, oscillations, because it turns out even though there's this strong period here, there's also a weaker period here, which is actually the resonances of the vocal tract. There's a resonance in there, which has got this little decaying exponential thing, approximately, right? Like that little example we saw in pure data. So the, what happens in the voice is the, 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 the glottal folds slap together, they excite this resonance, and then they do it again, etc. So here is the autocorrelation. Here is the, the flanking peaks, which are almost as large as this peak here because it's almost a periodic si signal. It isn't purely periodic, but it's sort of it's pushing that way. And then here are these secondary peaks coming from these secondary peaks, and here are these resonances. So now you see that the autocorrelation here tells us a lot about the structure of that signal. Of course, the signal itself tells us a lot about the structure of the signal, too. But in some cases, the autocorrelation is uh, an, a, a more stable thing to measure. I can take a fairly long signal calculate its autocorrelation and still look at it like this. Whereas this, if I'm having to look at the actual short-term signal, it's jumping around all over the place. Here are two signals, you know, to give me a cross-correlation, and then the cross-correlation in this case does have some nice maxima, but it doesn't occur at zero. You know, there's no particular symmetry or structure to it. So that's what we get with, with correlation. Um, I just want to tell you one more thing. So, again, I'm trying to tie this back to, to real practice. As you know, I'm making videos of these, of these classes. And so I have my little, just my point-and-shoot camera at the back um, shooting the video. There's a microphone on there, so it gets what I'm saying. But it's pretty noisy. It's actually amazing. If you've ever done this, it's amazing how, a, you know, the kind of audio that's recorded by something like that, just a single microphone at the back of a room. It's really the, the noise, which doesn't sound so bad when you're sitting here, but when you listen to the recording, it's very, very noisy. So when I started doing this, it was like, well, I can't use the audio. It's barely audible, barely intelligible. So then I have a separate microphone, separate recorder here, which is recording what I'm saying. And then afterwards, I splice them together. So I take the video, and I take my close mic recording and edit them together. But they're separate devices, and so they don't don't exactly line up, and so to begin with, I would just like line them up by, by eye or by ear at the beginning. Um, but then I found that by the end of the lecture, they drift. And the reason is that they're both trying to record at some nominal sampling rate, but, you know, but they don't have any kind of magical way of synchronizing their sampling rates. And it turns out they're using crystal oscillators. Crystal oscillators are normally pretty good to like a few hundred parts per million. So, you know, uh, less than one part in a thousand. But one part in a thousand over an hour long lecture is like three seconds, 3600 second lecture. That's a pretty big drift. And so even if it's just, you know, 100 parts per million, it's still going to be getting on for half a second off by the end of the lecture, which is really disturbing if the, if the you know, you can see someone talking, but their, their voice is either half a second early or half a second late. So, I needed something better, and so what I was doing initially was I would line it up at the beginning, 
go to the end of the video, estimate the time skew, and then stretch the audio by the appropriate amount, and then redo it. Took took me a long time. So I thought, well, I, you know, I shouldn't have to do this by hand. So I wrote a MATLAB script, and what that does is it reads in the audio from the camera, reads in the audio from the recorder, and then goes through at every 10 seconds, takes out the windows and calculates the cross-correlation. And this is the plot. Okay, so this is seconds within the lecture, and this is like up to 4,200 seconds, something like that, 70 minutes. And then this is the short time cross-correlation of these 10-second windows. And this is in seconds, so it's between one second and two and a half seconds here. And now you can see that there's this drift. There's this peak in the cross-correlation. So at the beginning of the lecture, you know, the, um, the mic audio was like one point, almost two seconds behind because I started the mic a little later than the camera. But then it gradually marches forward. So by the end, it's only 1.5, no, 1.7 seconds behind. What's interesting is this isn't straight, actually. And I think what's actually happening, more than the drift in the, um, in the crystal oscillators, is that every now and again, the camera drops a frame. And it's sort of adjusted. Somehow, it, it, it just loses a little bit of time and does it in a nonlinear way. And so you end up with a slightly nonlinear curve. But anyway, I can write code that can go through, find these maxima, try and fit a linear slope to it, and then automatically resample the audio for me. And by the way, it knows what the time skew is. So then it goes in and pastes it on the video at the right timing, and now it's all automated. This is actually the, the correlation between, this is the, the clean mic signal, this is the signal from the camera, which you can see is much noisier just because it's got this high level of background noise. And this is the correlation between them, the cross-correlation for these 10 second excerpts, and you can see here's this peak at two seconds, which is saying, well, you know, it's really kind of hard to see, but um, I guess it's this way. Well, which way? We're looking for like a two second shift. So somewhere there is, yeah, I think it's this, right? These pulses here, this, this bit of speech here shows up here. But the cross-correlation finds it for me without any ambiguity. I just look for the largest point in the cross-correlation. I get the uh, appropriate timing out. So this is something that actually is really useful. Yeah. Hang on. So, uh, so there's this, there's this that, okay, that's a, that's a very nice point. I just said that the problem with these two signals was that one was slightly stretched than the other, and it's like, well, wait, does that work? So if you have one, if they have these two signals and one's stretched and one isn't, can you cross-correlate? No, that wouldn't, if you, if you stretch one, basically now you're, you're messing up all the dimensions, it doesn't work. But the stretch is only, you know, 0.01%. And so on the... On this 10 seconds of signal, which is 160,000 samples or something, you know, it's, it's only shifting me off by, if it's one, you know, one part per 10,000, it's maybe one sample off by the end, or a couple of samples off by the end. That doesn't mess up the autocorrelation too much. It, it will mess it up a little bit, and it, as you continue to stretch it, it gets worse and worse. But at this level, by using a short time correlation, I'm okay. I, I do this, I do this for, I, I do a lot of this stuff because I'm, in the audio, in the, in the music stuff, we're often, we'll get, uh, someone will, you know, do some manual annotation on, on a music track. The Beatles, like there's, there's this wonderful, there's this guy in London who went through all the Beatles tracks and manually labeled where all the chord changes are, which we can then use for chord recognition. But he can't, so he, and he published, he, he said, I've done all this work, you can use these annotations. Um, but, but he couldn't send us his copies of the Beatles because, you know, the copyright and the RAAA would get upset if he sent the audio. So he sends out his, his annotation tracks. But we already have the audio here, right? We own a copy. So it's like, oh, that's fine. We'll just, you know, try and line it up. But we have the same problem that, oh, it turns out that his, his version wasn't quite the same duration because when they mastered the CD, they played the tapes, the magnetic tapes, and the magnetic tapes stretch over time. So there's, a, again, a small drift of a few, you know, less than one part per thousand. It's enough to mess up these things. So then it's like, okay, well, let's just run the correlation. I'll send him my audio. He can run a correlation. But now the stretch over that entire track, if I try and correlate the whole thing and get one answer, it doesn't work. So if I tried to correlate these whole things and get a single peak, the peak wants to be stretched between 1.5 and 2 seconds, and the whole thing gets, gets blurred out. But the shorter the amount of time I do it over, the more compact that is, and so the easier it is to pick out. 
So I, I think that's what you were saying. It's like, wait, does, does cross-correlation solve this, this type, clock drift problem? No, it doesn't. But as long as the clock drift is small, we can ignore it for short segments, and then we can solve the problem over longer segments. Well, that, so on the other hand, the, the advantage of cross-correlation, if I took just this little, you know, quarter of a second or something and compared it to this quarter of a second here, there's a lot of, you know, these signals are very different. This one's got a lot of noise. It's also got the reflections of the room. They wouldn't give a terribly good similarity. You know, it could be that my voice just happens to line up with the noise and you get a noisy thing. As I stretch out the amount of time that I'm taking the correlation over, then the noise parts, you know, there's always some noise, random chance cor correlation, but, it, but it's all different places, so it, it, it averages out. But the true correlation, the fact that there's a little bit of signal that actually is in here, that stuff keeps adding up. And so over a shorter window, this is why I'm using 10-second windows, over a one-second window, apart from the fact that I want to be able to see a skew, which is within a 10-second thing, but even if I had it lined up, it would be very noisy. But as I get longer and longer, this thing gets clearer, until we get to the problem where it's so long that I'm actually getting significant clock skew. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off there. Yeah? So I just had how you're doing this, but can you explain again? So you, if you have the auto correlation of the signal, yeah. so you, you have a specific result. How, how, do you, how does that result help you to fix the problem you're trying yeah. to fix? Can you please explain that? Yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, so this is 4,000-something four, 4, seconds of, of signal. Here's one window, which is one 10-second window of that. And here's you know, the, the clean mic and the, the uh, distant mic. And here's the correlation, which I calculated, has this nice big peak, says that they're two seconds uh, skewed. And so this, this thing here, this sequence, I actually took it and I plotted it up like this. And I plotted it as the values there as this sort of grayscale. You can't, it looks kind of like gray, but you can see, maybe see a little bit, a few ripples in here. So actually, vertically, I've got many, many, many cross-correlations here. And then the, the blackness is how, how high the values are. And so then the red point is I just took the largest point in every column. And then you can see that this maximum, this best time here, it's just under two seconds, which is the actual value here. But, as, but if I, that was for the you know, 10 seconds near the beginning of the lecture. When I do this towards the end of the lecture, it looks kind of the same, but now the maximum is at 1.7 seconds. And so that's the, what these red, red points are telling me, that in, that in that particular time vicinity, what was the best time alignment between these two? At the beginning, the best alignment was by shifting them by two seconds. By the end, it was shifting them by 1.7 seconds. And I, and I do whatever I have to do to make sure that works across the whole thing. OK. OK, so that's. Uh, that's correlation. I hope that gave you some bit more insight into what it's good for. And now, only 45 minutes late, we can get on to this week's lecture. All right, so at the beginning of the semester, I think I mentioned that really the, there's one big trick in signal processing. In signal processing, not just discrete time signal processing, but the whole thing, it's all based around the idea of the Fourier transform. The idea that there's this equivalent representation for a signal in terms of, of sinusoids. And uh, it it's, it's, doesn't sound like that much, really. But it, you know, it, and it isn't, it isn't really that much. <laughs> But um, it is pretty useful, and it gives, us, um, it gives us this whole set of tools that we can use for modifying signals and for getting information out. Up until now, we've just been working in the time domain because things like you know, difference equations, actual the systems that we build, they operate in the time domain, or they can, they can very efficiently be implemented in the time domain. Um, but now we can start talking about the transform domain, the Fourier domain, which is this kind of mathematical magic that's going to give us the way to, to work and do more interesting things. So this is now, we, and I'm sure, you, I know you've all seen the Fourier domain before, either in continuous time or 
quite likely in discrete time as well. So again, a lot of this will be stuff that you've heard before. But again, I want to go through it because I want to draw out some points and hopefully um, give you some additional insight into what's going on. So I'll talk about the, for the, the basic idea of representing signals by, by sinusoids. And then we'll talk about how that works in the discrete time domain, which is basically we're doing this, but we're assuming that we're talking about sequences rather than continuous time signals. And that's the discrete time Fourier transform, DTFT. And then we'll talk about well, what happens if, you, if I really want to do this on the, do this on the computer, I don't, need, I don't only need discrete time, I need finite length. And so that, that's when we have the discrete time Fourier transform of a finite length sequence, we get the discrete Fourier transform which is the thing we can actually calculate on our computers, the DFT. And then finally, we'll look at um, how we can use the DFT for convolution, which is you know, one of the reasons that it's so powerful. OK, so the basic um, Fourier transform idea from Joseph Fourier in, back in the 18th century um, is that if we have a signal which is periodic, so the signal itself repeats every period, every bi period big T here. But it can be any shape, right? It just some arbitrary shape, but if you, it has some arbitrary shape, but after T, it repeats again, does the same thing. Well, you can approximate that signal as a sum of sinusoids. In this case, I'm using cosine with, a, with an amplitude and a phase. That's like an arbitrary sinusoid. And these sinusoids are uh, not any sinusoid, but just a, a sort of a, a discrete set of sinusoids whose frequencies are multiples of the, or whose periods are submultiples of the period. If we have a, a period t, we can talk about a fundamental frequency with frequency 1 over t. And so in cosine terms, that would be 2 pi on t times time. And then we're saying the, the sinusoids that we use are 2 pi on t times k, where k is an integer. So it's like some integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. We call these harmonics, harmonics of the fundamental. And so this, you know, this is, this, this was, I think, I, I, I'm not actually sure on the, the history. I know that a lot of uh, this stuff was uh, used initially for, understanding the, um, the motion of planets because there's this relative motion of our orbit and the orbit of the other, other planets. So if you watch a planet against the stars, you know, it'll do these little loops. And this, these are these complex, but complex motions, but they were entirely reproducible and they were periodic. And so it's like, well, how do we describe these loops? And so you can describe them nicely with, with Fourier um, decompositions. Of course, that was before they realized that it was because they were coming from composite circular motions. Um, so here's our, our basic, you know, pure real Fourier decomposition. There's the sum for some finite number of sinusoids, k equals 0 to m, a k, an amplitude for each one, two pi, cosine 2 pi k on t, the kth harmonic with some particular phi, phase, phi of k. And, you know, the most kind of unlikely case is like, well, you mean you can do this for any, any, any periodic sequence? What about a periodic sequence with discontinuities? How can you make something with a discontinuity out of sinusoids, sinusoids all being, you know, continuous, smooth? So, but it turns out that you can, at least, you know, um, for, from an engineer's point of view, you can. And so for, here's an example, a square wave, and it just turns out that we, we, you know, without proof, we can say, well, it, the, for, we can generate a square wave from this equation by basically using 1 on k as the amplitudes, the a of k's, for odd-numbered harmonics. And then it turns out we have to flip the sign every other one. So this is just a number which is positive for flip sign for every other odd number. And the even harmonics are all zero. So if we write that out, expand that out, we get x of t is cosine of 2 pi on big T, t, which is the fundamental, minus 1 third cosine 2 pi on big T, 3t, 
So this is the third harmonic, and we've got one third and negative sign plus one fifth, cosine two pi on two pi on big T, five T is the fifth harmonic. The scaling is one fifth, and this time it's positive. Here um, is the plot of a bunch of these terms. This is the green one is the, the fundamental. The red one is the third harmonic. So you can see here, the fundamental does one half cycle in this interval. The third harmonic does three half cycles. That's so three times the frequency. The cyan is the fifth harmonic, five cycles. And this magenta is seventh harmonic, seven cycles. And so we take the, the fundamental, we subtract the third harmonic, we add the fifth harmonic, subtract seventh harmonic. If we do that with the appropriate scalings, here they're scaled by one over n, we get this, actually no, that's, they're already, they've already done that, right? Where is zero? Okay, here's zero. So zero, the fundamental is positive, the third harmonic is negative, the fifth harmonic is positive, seventh harmonic is negative. So they're actually, I've in incorporated the, these scaling factors here. When we sum up all these things, we get this blue line, which is beginning to look like a square wave. It's not a square wave yet, but as we add them, it gets closer and closer. Let me just quickly show you that animation in MATLAB, because I have it. Um, So um, every time I press a key, it shows me the next harmonic, and then it sort of adds them in here. You can see the cyan is what it was last time around, and this is after adding one-third of the third harmonic. Here's the fifth harmonic. We add in that. Seventh harmonic, ninth. And you can see that every time, you know, the difference between the cyan and the blue here is just this, this sinusoid here. But what it does is it's sort of flattening out the part in the middle, sharpening up the edge here, and uh, eventually we, get, we can get an arbitrarily good approximation to a square wave by adding more and more harmonics. This is the th up to the 35th harmonic, 37th, 39th. What we see here is, you know, these are looking quite flat now. These are looking quite sharp. How are we getting this discontinuity? Well, it, you know, it, it is sort of doing something nice and smooth and continuous. It's sort of suddenly these oscillations build up. The oscillations are kind of like the frequency of the, the final harmonic we're adding. And then it suddenly shoots all across because suddenly all the cosine terms start moving positive at the same time so that their slopes all reinforce and you get this large slope. And you sort of have to accept under some measure of convergence that this is converging towards a square wave. Well, you'll notice just in passing there's this stuff that looks like ringing. If you've ever dealt with, you know, badly behaved, um, uh, um, you know, <laughs> amplifiers. A badly behaved amplifier will have this kind of behavior, uh, ringing, and uh, we'll 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 hear more about that later. But it's still um, it's still a, getting close to a um, a square wave, in particular in squared error terms, you can get it arbitrarily close to a square wave. Um, okay, so that's the basic idea, right? That we can take any sequence, if it's periodic, we can, um, we, we can build out a sinusoid even if it doesn't look anything like a sinusoid. Um, that was the, the, the idea and, you know, it was a question, it, it was a question of proving it and uh, it became proved. So now we can use it. Okay, now, what this means is if we have a periodic signal, we can plot it in the time domain. We can draw one cycle of its waveform. We've got it well defined. Or I can give you its, uh, the amplitudes of the sinusoids, the amplitudes and the phases of the sinusoids, and uh, it's also well defined. And so there's a second way of um, looking, at the, looking at the signal in terms of these coefficients. So these are now as a function of the harmonic number k, the amplitude a k, and then here what I've done is rather than letting a k go negative, I've defined it as strictly positive, but the phase here is the, the phi k inside the, uh, you know, inside the cosine. So to get the negative numbers, I just give it a, 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 phase, a phase of pi, which is cosine of theta plus pi is negative cosine of theta. 
So we have to, we have this kind of, you know, complex-like representation of these harmonics, but we can represent it by the set of harmonics. And what's interesting is that we started off with actually a continuous sequence, con sorry, a continuous, continuous function of time, and now we can represent it by a set of discrete values, although we might need a lot of them. We might need countably, you know, a countably infinite set of discrete values, but we've represented it. And in a sense, or not in, even in a sense, they are describing the same thing, right? I can either describe the signal in the time domain or in terms of its Fourier transform, its Fourier coefficients here, which are what we're going to call a Fourier transform. But they're the same signal. It's not that like one's the true signal and one's like a derived thing. They're just, they're, they're both the same things. It's just different ways of expressing the same things. And that's the kind of, that's the, 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 the mental jump of the Fourier transform. It's like, it's not something you can do with time domain. It's another domain, which is just as good as time domain, at least from math's point of view. It's, uh, it's equally valid. It has the same, has very similar properties. Um, Rather than dealing with this magnitude and phase, we can use complex math um, so we can express the, the Fourier uh, decomposition like this. That the periodic signal x, of, x twiddle of t is approximated by the sum over some finite range of harmonics of some complex constant c sub k, which is now a sub k times e to the j phi of k times e to the j 2 pi k on t. So this is now a complex exponential. I guess that c sub k needs to divide by 2 in it somewhere. But we have a, a positive going exponential and a negative going exponential. We have both of them because we have k for po both positive and negative. So we can add them together. We can cancel out the imaginary parts. We can get cosines out. But with this form, we can also get uh, arbitrary complex periodic sequences expressed. And then the, the c of k's will not be balanced. But this is basically the same expression, but just written in terms of complex exponentials. Um, so I've sort of asserted that this, you can express a periodic sequence in this form. The big question then is, well, what are the C of Ks? So if, if I've got my, sorry, if I've got my, not a sequence, but a function, if I've got my function of time, and I want to express it in terms of its Fourier series, representation, how do I find the, uh, the coefficients? And the way you do it is one of these inner products again. You take the, int and this is now an inner product over an, a continuous space, so it's like, it's very difficult to relate to like 3D vectors, but it's the same thing. We take the integral of the signal multiplied by one of these complex sinusoids, or it's, it's actually its conjugate, we integrate that over one complete cycle of this periodic function, right? That it, from minus t on two to big t, to t on t on two is one complete cycle. So that's everything we need to know about the signal. We divide it by t to get, you know, the, the average. Um, but this inner product of x of t times e to the minus j two pi k on big t of t for some value k for some particular harmonic gives us the coefficient of that harmonic. And so this is like, this is pretty neat. Um, it's saying that if we want to know how much e to the j 2 pi kt on t we need to add in to make our approximation, we just take that same e to the j 2 pi kt, conjugate it, multiply it against the signal, integrate it up, and we get the coefficient coming out. So it's not, it's not self-evident, but um, that's what works. Um, we should just go through and try and make sense of that. Um, remember, this is one way, so here's one way of doing it, the kind of the way that if we're not super comfortable with complex numbers, we can just turn it back into a, you know, a normal expression. So we have Euler's equation here that e to the j theta is cosine theta plus j sine theta, which is just saying if it's on the complex plane, the e to the j theta has a real projection, which is cosine theta, imaginary projection, which is sine theta, but it's on the imaginary axis, so it's j sine theta. So we can take this thing, we can rewrite this as cosine minus 2 pi k on big T t plus j sine of minus 2 pi k on big T t, 
and then we can write those up as two separate um, integrals, right? So this integral, we break, here's the, the cosine part, and here's the sine part, which is now the j comes out here, and then the sine of minus 2 pi k on t is the minus of the sine, because sine is odd. The, sine of, the cosine of minus 2 pi is just the same as cosine of 2 pi k t, t on big T, so the, the minus disappears here. But we get this, 1 on big T, the integral of x of t times cosine 2 pi k on big T times t, minus j, integral of x of t, sine of 2 pi k on big T times t. Um, where these are now the cosine and the sine versions of the complex exponential, the, the kth harmonic, right? It's k these, this cosine completes k cycles for every big T, one cycle of the, the periodic signal, same for the sine, and k is an integer. Um, so what, what's, uh, what can we do with this? Well, let's imagine right now we're trying to take the, we're trying to find the Fourier series representation for a sinusoid. So if x of t is cosine 2 pi on big T times L, where we assume L is also an integer. This is just a sinusoid that completes L cycles in big T. So it's periodic in big T. It's actually periodic in big T on L, but it's also periodic in big T. If it was this, then we know that, well, that's, that's going to work if we have CK non-zero for K equal to L, right? We're going to need the two complex sinusoids that have this frequency. And we want CK to be zero for everything else because we're going to be able to build it out of just those two sinusoids. So we know that we expect CK to be zero except where K equals L. We're going to need minus L as well because we're going to need to cancel out the imaginary parts to get the cosine. So what happens? On the previous slide, right, we said that the actual CK was the integral of X times the cosine minus J times X times the sine. So here they are. Here's x times the cosine minus j, x times the sine. If we look at these, well, this one is cosine of 2 pi lt times sine 2 pi of kt for l, and l is whatever frequency we're looking at, k is the index of the coefficient we're trying to get. Sine is always odd, right? So it's, it goes through zero and it's positive, where it's positive on t greater than zero is negative for t less than zero. Cosine is always even, where it's positive for t greater than zero, it's also positive for t less than zero. So this, these are like, we can pair these up either side of t. Remember, the integral is from minus t on 2 to t on 2. We can pair these up. They're always going to be um, odd, right? So the product of an even and odd is itself odd. The integral of an odd function over a symmetric range around zero is zero. So this part disappears. We're only left with this part to worry about. So ck is just the integral of cosine 2 pi l t on big t times cosine 2 pi kt on big T. So we can work that through, and it works because here, this is this, just that part. This thing, well, if we, you know, fudge the, or if we m rewrite the constant so it's an integral over minus pi to pi, like, you know, one, one cycle, then this is, this is equal to 1, when k equals plus or minus l, zero otherwise, and this is basically the orthogonality of, of sinusoids, right? That if, there, if I have two sinusoids that complete an equal number of cycles, sorry, an integer number of cycles in some interval, but they're different integers, then if I multiply them together and integrate out, I get zero unless they're the same signal. And here's just an example of uh, one and two, and you can sort of see, well, okay, they're symmetric around here, so it's just this part but then we've got this sort of odd even thing going on where this one is positive and negative and this one is the same, this one sort of get reflects. So for every pair of points here, I can find the same pair of points here, which are the same values with the opposite sign, so they'll cancel out. So that's sort of uh, what you think about, but we can just do it algebraically because there's an, a triggered entity, cosine A times cosine B is equal to a half of cosine A plus B plus cosine A minus B. And then we can do the integral here. The cosines become sine. So cos cosine of a t, the integral of that is 1 over a sine of a t. So we get these things coming out. And then we can, sub we can substitute in the um, limits. And what we get is 
a half of sine k plus l times pi divided by k plus pi times k plus l. And so it's sine of x, sine of x on x for these two values of x, pi, pi, pi k plus l, pi k minus l. Sine of x on x, we have a special name for that, sinc. Um, and so it's this thing here, and then, as we'll see, that actually gives us this property that this sinc is actually zero for any multiple of pi, any integer multiple of pi, except zero. So the only times that these terms are non-zero for integer k and l are when this term is zero because k is equal to minus l, or this term is zero because k is equal to l. So let's just look at the sinc function is going to come up a few times. So let's just look at that here. So sine of, sinc of x is sine of x divided by x. The blue line here is sine of x. The green line here is x, y equals x, right? So I, if I divide the blue line by the green line, well, clearly out here, we're taking this nice sinusoid and we're just dividing it by something that gets larger and larger as time goes on. So we get this sinusoid, but it's decaying away. But it's not decaying away exponentially, it's decaying away linearly or one, reciprocally, 1 over x, right? But it's a decaying sinusoid. Same on the negative sign, although we're di dividing it by a negative number here now, so it's actually there's a sign flip that goes on. What happens around zero is, you know, I think they're a little strange, but we know, we, we notice that they kind of appear to line up here, right? That the green line and the blue line sort of seem to fall on the same line. And then we know if, if we've done any kind of power series expansion that for very small x, sine x is approximately equal to x. And so we understand that uh, from either direction, as we get close to zero, this thing converges to one. And uh, right in the middle, we've got sine of zero divided by zero, which sort of sounds like a problem. But our math friends tell us it's okay for us to assume it's zero, it's one in this point. So we just fill in the gap and have a nice continuous thing. So now we have this um, sinc function, which has this property that for every multiple of pi, it goes through zero, because these are the zero crossings of the original sign, except at zero, where it goes through one. And so that's, this, that's what we wanted. That, um, that on this slide that we wanted this product, which is this integral, to be um, to be zero for all values of k other than plus or minus l. It turns out that the actual value is a half because to get our cosine l, you know, two pi l on big T times T. We take the e to the j plus l and the e to the j minus l. We add them together. The sine parts cancel out. We get 2 cosine 2 pi l t on big T, t. And so then we scale that by half to get the cosine 2 pi l big T on t coming out. So it all, it all works. And I, I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not super interested in... It's not that important to me to go through exactly getting the scaling constants right. Although it is, it is necessary for you to be able to do that. <laughs> but that's why, I'm, for me, the, the high order bit is just like, yeah, it's, it's, one, it's something. It's a finite value at the right frequencies. It's zero everywhere else. That's what we wanted to prove. That's the, that was what we're trying to get to, that we've, if we use this identity for figuring out the CKs, it gives us the right, it gives us the right CKs. It gives us the, just two of these uh, complex, complex sinusoids coming out, the ones that match the thing we're trying to analyze. If you remember, what the whole, where we started from this was trying to find the CKs for this particular X, X of T. Um, okay, so this is what we just checked. We didn't exactly prove it, but we, sh we showed that um, given this definition that, C, that our Fourier series is x of t as sum of ck e to the j 2 pi k t on, on big T times t for some set of ranges of values of k. Um, we, can find those, we can find the actual values here by this integral here. Now, we only showed this for one, for x equal to one particular sinusoid. We showed, yeah, well, if, if x is, is actually a cosine, then it works. But what happens is, um, 
what we saw was that, well, if we have a, if we have a particular sinusoid in X, um, we do this integral, this kind of inner product, against all these different frequencies. And then for all the ones that are of different frequencies, you get zero coming out. So it's like this integral picks out just one frequency term and then tells you how much energy there is in it, which gives you the C of K. And so the, the Fourier series is saying, well, I can take this signal, I can imagine it as the summation of all these different frequencies, right, with some scaling coefficients. And then what we've seen is, yes, and this, this analysis equation, it basically ignores all the other components except for the one that we're looking at and just finds out what the amplitude is for that. And so that's the, you know, that's the basic idea of, of the sinusoidal, the, the Fourier representation, that we can, by using this Fourier analysis, we can see the energy of each individual sinusoid. And it relies on this idea of the inner products between sinusoids of different frequencies sort of disappearing, except when the frequencies line up, when they reinforce, and we get the, the particular uh, amplitude out. So um, that was for a periodic function, x of t, x twiddle of t, and we ended up with a set of discrete um, Fourier series coefficients for all the harmonics of t. But if t gets, if big t gets very large, then the amount of time you have to wait before you see the next repeat of the cycle becomes very long. It might become so long that you never actually see it. And then the, the fundamental frequency, for a very, very long period, the fundamental frequency is very, very small. And so all the harmonics of that fundamental frequency are very close together. And as t goes to infinity, they become every possible frequency. It becomes continuous. So that takes us, I mean, you know, that's typical math uh, sort of, you know, abstraction, but that takes us from the Fourier series to the Fourier transform, where now, instead of having a set of discrete values for every harmonic of some fundamental period, we have a function of some frequency, which is now a continuous frequency variable. So in, we have, in principle, every frequency. I guess not in principle. We have every frequency present. And, it, and now we can apply it to any signal. We no longer have to, we no longer have to stipulate that the signal we're looking at is is periodic. So this is the general Fourier transform that x of j times omega, where omega is a frequency in radians per second, and the j is, you know, in some sense just convention, but I'll make draws this link to the Laplace transform if you remember. X of, but x is a function of omega. The Fourier transform is a function of frequency, is the integral over all time of the time domain function x of t times e to the minus j omega t, the conjugate, you know, so the negative going complex sinusoid of frequency omega, omega radians per second. That gives us the coefficients of frequency, and then the synthesis equation to get back from the frequency domain representation to the time is almost the same thing. So it's just integral over all values of omega of x for that omega times e to the j omega t. So now we have the actual direct sine. So this is, this is kind of what we expect the, the Fourier transform to say, that we can build this time function by summing up all these sinusoids with different amplitudes, in this case, complex amplitudes, so different phases and magnitudes. There's a one on two pi scaling in here, which is uh, not worth worrying about. But to get this, we, if, we, if we believe that we can generate this uh, representation terms sinusoid, which we can, then this is how we find out what the amplitudes of the sinusoids are. So that is, you know, the uh, Fourier transform, and this is like a Fourier transform pair, and that's, you know, that's how we dealt with it in continuous time. What we're going to talk about next time is what happens if now x of t is not a continuous function, but it's a sequence. But the thing, the, thing, the thing to really notice about this is the symmetry of it, right? These equations look almost the same, you can take this 1 on 2 pi and divide it. You know, you can have 1 on square root of 2 pi for each one because it doesn't really matter about scaling. You can go from one to the other, and, there, and the point about this is this point that there's no privilege for either of these. I can show you the time domain function. I can show you the frequency domain function. They're both equally useful. They're the same size. You know, they're both continuous functions of a single variable in general, continuous complex functions of a sing single variable. And they both kind of do the same thing. And so through this set, through this basis of sinusoids, 
we have two equivalent and very, very similar representations for signal, but the signal looks different in each case, and so there may be many cases where it's more useful to think about it in terms of its Fourier representation than its time representation. Any questions about that? All right, we'll, we'll continue developing this in continuous time, uh, in discrete time on Wednesday. <laughs>